Welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is Chief Executive Officer Nora O'Brien with Connect Consulting Services, a women-owned emergency management and business continuity planning firm. We're here to discuss planning for the worst in sports, survival in a crisis. Welcome, Nora. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. You do some really important work. I know Connect Consulting helps organizations who need guidance and emergency planning and business continuity. Emergency planning is when a company makes a plan to follow in the time of a crisis, and business continuity is planning how a business will continue to operate when its business operations have been disrupted. So Nora, please give us an example of why it's important to have a written plan for emergencies and business continuity. For sure. Um, I think what emergency operations plan, think about it's your response. What are you going to do to respond to disaster? And it could be your response within your internal organization and how you're going to um, how you're going to respond. Of who do you need additional staff? Do you need to reduce staff? Do you need to, you know, or and then externally for your organization in terms of you know dealing with sports organizations, they often have some kind of you know they're going to be coordinating most likely with emergency operations centers in your communities, et cetera. And so understanding internally what your process is, who's going to, who's going to, what are you going to do? Who's in charge? What steps you're going to take? What, what are your action steps? So your emergency operations plan will tell you um, and guide your process for about two weeks after disaster. What your continuity plan does and what you want to do is what we call do it in sunny skies when you're not in the midst of a disaster and, you know, COVID, that's a whole nother um, we'll we'll talk about it in a bit. Um, but when you when you have a business continuity plan, you're identifying your business process. You're identifying alternate alternate business process, alternate supply chain, alternate staffing, alternate work location, alternate um, you know other things that you can need to do in order to to keep your business running. You've identified when things have to come back up after disaster. Is it a re recovery time objective or an RTO that we call, um, referred to as an RTO? Is it within two hours of disaster or within 24 hours or 48 hours, depending on what it is? And is there an impact for that specific thing? Is there a life safety impact? Is there a, um, you know, a legal ish impact or is there a regulatory compliance impact if those things don't come back after disaster? And when you have a business continuity plan in place, you ideally want to, once you activate your emergency operations plan and who's in charge and what's, you know, what steps that you're going to take, you ideally want to activate your continuity plan almost as immediately after disaster happens because you're going to have both short-term and re long-term recovery options. Um, you're going to have to identify, let's say your building's damaged and you can't get back in the building for 60, 90 days. Are you going to move some of your business operations to another location? Are you going to have people work remotely? Are you going to do a hybrid or something like that? You've got to got to make some decisions, and that's when that continuity process will will kick in, and why that's important. And and what determines the, when the business continuity plan kicks in? How does someone know when they to kind of move from the emergency management plan and process into the business continuity plan? Great question. So. Ideally, you really want to have kind of two sets within your organization of folks. One set of incident management team or IMT that we often refer to or incident command that will be focused just on the response. And then ideally, if when a large organization like sports organizations, whether, you know, Sacramento Kings, where we are located here in Sacramento, or, you know, or the Yankees or whoever, whatever kind of sports organization you are, you definitely want to have another set of folks that are focusing on, you know, an, another incident management team focused on their on the disaster, on the business continuity plan. So they can, you're going to coordinate those folks. And that's why you have an uh, uh, incident commander or incident command structure that is going to coordinate both the response and the recovery. But um, more importantly, you you ideally want to have two sets because they're they're different activities. Um, they're ac different activities, but they're both important in order to get you to minimize those business, business interruptions as much as possible. And more importantly, not just minimize those business interruptions, but um, 
get you to recovery and disaster resilience as quickly as possible. But you have other players that impact your ability to move into that next phase, right? You have other emergency responders, other For government sure. officials. And so yeah. how do you guide and advise sports organizations, groups that are you know, trying to move forward that maybe aren't emergency professionals themselves, but have had to activate a plan? How do you advise them to work with those uh, first responders and government officials to move forward into the business continuity plan? Right. I think the um, the answer is actually long, it, the, you know, advanced planning. So that's we talk about emergency preparedness. You want to be on the preparedness side. So ideally, what most important we'd like you to do is to plan in advance with those partners so you know them well in advance of dis when disaster strikes. So rather than you send handing them your business card when you're standing in the emergency operations center for your county or city and hi, this is who we are, and this is what we can do. Here's our capabilities, here's what our here's what our needs are. We need a generator, we need whatever those things are. You want to, and we do drills and exercises all the time. You want to do that well in advance of disaster and you have that relationship and maybe a memorandum of understanding of what you, what the sports organization will do in a disaster. We've often seen sports organizations stand up and be there as to cite, um, you know, I know in San Diego during the fires in, 20, in 2007, when I was working this really big fire, you know, I know Charger Stadium, you know, they were, or um, you know, Charger Stadium was, um, Stir, stood up as a emergency, basically shelter, and we've seen that over and over again. So, doing that in it well in advance of disaster, so you know what that role is, and the more you kind of exercise and discuss that well in advance of disaster, again that minimizes those business interruptions. It minimizes the um, the you know the chaos that happens with any kind of disaster. So, yeah. know your partners in advance. That that's a short and sweet answer. Right. So the sports facilities are often partners in an emergency response, uh, especially if they have not been affected by mm -hmm. an emergency or disaster. You mentioned about the incident command management. system. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about the FEMA's training and the National Incident <laughs> Management System and how important that is for sports groups to reflect on that process? That's a that's a great question. So um Incident command system has actually been around since the 70s. And really what the, the focus is, it's not so much who the positions are. It's having a system to identify roles and responsibilities about things that you need to do to manage a disaster as effectively as possible. So you can take the FEMA courses, but more importantly for your organization, you should have some kind of incident management team or incident command system that you have pre-identified the roles that people are going to play to manage a disaster. So there's FEMA training you can take. We train staff, but more importantly, you develop an incident command system that's going to work, that's organic to your organization. Who has those roles and responsibilities? And But ideally, so as you have an incident commander, you have kind of the core positions are incident commander, you have a public information officer that's going to share information internally, what's the needs are, and also communicate those needs to, let's say, county or city emergency operations center. And then you have a liaison officer to say, we need a generator or we need resources or we have these resources. We want to coordinate resources. You have a liaison officer to liaison outside your organization. And then you have four key positions. So you have, you have an operations um, section. And their job is those are the folks who are the doers. And whatever those doers are, it's going to be different by every disaster. And then you have a planning team. And your planning planning uh, division is going to be planning what you're going to do the next six hours, the next six days, the next six weeks. And in terms of COVID, the next 60 years, it's kind of how it's been, how it's felt. Um, like just because this is this event has gone on so long, which is not the norm for most disasters. And then you have a logistics team, the people, those are the getters. The logistics folks are the folks that um, get the supplies and equipment and, you know, you know, feed the crew and all of those logistics folks. And then the other most important people with people that we don't want to forget are the finance and administration folks, because they're going to track the cost of disaster, you know, dealing with your insurance company and knowing how you pay for overtime and not just with your insurance company, 
but FEMA reimbursement, potential FEMA reimbursement down the road. So those key key pieces pieces all come together to manage your your disaster, and it could be internally. And what a lot of people don't realize is a disaster that can be within your organization. Maybe your building, maybe you have a water main break, and you can't, um, you know, in, in a major part of your building that only affects your organization. It doesn't. It's not even a community-wide event, or it's not even something that's a global pandemic, or it affects, you know, uh, like your, you know, you've been impacted by a flood or whatever it may be. So understanding those systems and process. And, and having that identified with a plan well in advance and knowing your partners um, outside your organization. Your partners could, or partners can be emergency operations centers, but it also could be other private sector partners or it can be healthcare or whoever it may be. It could be child care providers, but you plan for that well in advance. So it's, it's interesting because there's Lots of notable incidents we could point to where sports have been affected. For example, the Metrodome in Minneapolis, Minnesota right. that collapsed due to snow in 2010. This affected the ability to use the facility while those repairs were, were being done. So what kind of advice and strategy would you recommend when a facility becomes damaged and is not usable and you know, there may be games scheduled and tickets sold and sponsors to keep happy. Right. So what kind of advice do you have in those circumstances? Um, so what what's that's part of your continuity planning. So when you're looking at uh, well in advance of disaster, you're looking at what are alternate facilities or alternate locations. Can you not that you can borrow your there's not always a stadium next door. That's not always convenient, but can you figure out again those that that's your workarounds that's that's part of continuity planning is minimizing those business interruptions and the more you can identify those things in a disaster um like can you do it at through your community colleges or or, or who else has that kind of stadium capacity or can you have to break it up into smaller you know smaller smaller locations but thinking of that in a disaster so and, and what's invaluable about the business continuity planning is the more you think of, you know, essentially, as we call in sunny skies, the more you think of well in advance, you've already done some of that pre-thinking. You've already figured out, oh, well, we can do X. Oh, yeah, we hadn't even thought about that. And I think COVID's really pushed us over the last few years. Supply chain, you know, whatever those kinds of challenges you've had due to COVID, and it's I mean, different for every organization, but you do things much differently than you ever would have thought before because of COVID, but you can now, um, you know, think of other ways like supply chain is, is one that really comes to mind because there's been so many disruptions, but you might've had staff you had to lay off and then had to bring back and furlough or, or you might've had, you know, um, you know, downturns and not being able to, to hold the games or you had to, increase your um, infectious control procedures or whatever those things are, whatever those workarounds are like, you know, the bubble that had to happen for, um, uh, you know, for NBA games, those kinds of things, um, NBA playoffs. So um, those workarounds are key. Absolutely. So the, the COVID has just surprised a lot of people with the extent of the disruptions. I think most of us expected to get back out there sooner and a lot of plans were not successful. And, and a lot of sports groups had to pivot, like you mentioned, the NBA playing their games in a bubble in a state that was more amenable to allowing teams to play and, yeah. and test and, and practice and perform. Um, and then other states had more, more strict standards in place. And that's really complicated with teams that compete nationally in different locations, different venues. So COVID, tell me what lessons have been learned through this pandemic. Yeah, I'd say the huge lessons, and I, you know, briefly touched on the the disruptions of of supply chain. The ripple effect of COVID has been that we, for the most part, have not like people have to understand. We have to give ourselves some grace in that not everyone had things figured out. Not a, not a lot of organizations, even small businesses, you know, didn't have business continuity plans or they had plans and they were not followed and they were not there or they weren't robust enough. And there, or they had procedures that were like nine inches thick. They had these beautifully color coded binders, 
but they didn't train their staff to them. So they weren't really helpful because they weren't, you really want a plan that is actionable and bullet pointed and check marks and those kinds of things. That's and, and what keeps your organization more resilient. So I think the other lessons learned is that we didn't quite understand the, 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 you know, kind of breadth and depth of, of the pandemic and not just specific to infectious control, but understanding how, what that ripple effect would have against their organizations. The other big lessons learned is that there was also challenges, but that could be turned into opportunities. What we've seen oftentimes is we've done a number of projects for clients uh, over the, uh, the last few years of organizations that said, I need a business continuity plan. I've never, you know, organizations have been around a hundred years one that was been around for 65 years. They've never had a business continuity plan before and they had every reason to. One of them was a, a utility that, you know, you could see the ocean from their front door. You could, you know, see the ocean from their front door. They, you could, um, you know, they're on a huge earthquake fault. They are in a high wildfire threat and never had a business continuity plan you know, after 65 years until we gave them one. So that's the other thing too. So there's some opportunities. The other thing I think that's, I have to say good in some ways is that preparedness is not something that people always see return on investment. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's something I have to do or it's an OSHA compliance or those kinds of things. But they often, you know, organizations and leadership finally go, oh, okay, I see that if we don't have, if we have supply chain disruptions and how that really, you know, whether it's, getting mini bats to sell, you know, when you go, when the games come back or whatever that thing is, that supply chain disruption, um, they finally understand, oh, there's value in doing this. So I think that could be a good thing. Not, um, we want, not that we want to go through another global pandemic the way we have, but <laughs> um, the issue is, is that there are some upsides and people finding the importance and seeing the importance and return on investment. Well, I know one of the challenges that a lot of facilities experienced during COVID with that supply chain disruption was getting access to cleaning supplies and oh, God, um, protective equipment, masks, gloves, things like that. So supply disruption, supply chain disruption, uh, certainly in supply shortages certainly had an impact um, in that regard. And I'm curious, so thinking about the Olympics that's coming to Los Angeles in 2028, uh, the, it's pretty standard when the Olympics happen that there's multiple venues spread in several locations. So how do you advise a client that has operations, major event operations spread out? They're not in a centralized location. Maybe that's ideal. Uh, what, do you, what do you do? What do you, how do you advise them to plan for emergency management purposes? Well, I would say... Um... I think Los Angeles is, I mean, that's my hometown. So I always speak to that, no problem. But I think the issue is it's you have to do a lot of advanced planning because it's not just what if something happens in one area. It's also evacuation routes. Is it, do, it's additional health care that's needed. You know, do you need additional, you know, ambulances on ha on stand? Do you need, pe do you need volunteers to make sure people evacuate safely out of the building? There is just a lot of moving parts to that large planning. And the more of that you do in advance, does it mean that you get it all done? But I, again, I want to go back to and stress the importance of drills and exercises are crucial. Those drills and exercises are important because um, that you're putting together a scenario. You're not saying, oh, let's just wait and see if something happens. It's the advanced planning of, okay, what if this is this is a likely scenario of something that can happen? And when we take scenarios, we take something that's, you know, most recently happened in maybe another part of the community. Um, and how can how can we apply those lessons learned from what happened there? And how we how can we learn and do better than we did, you know, in that previous incident? Um, that's the other thing that I love about the field of emergency management and business continuity is that we're passionate about process improvement because we've got to be, we have to do things a better way, even if things would necessarily flawlessly and nothing that things don't always do that, but you know, <laughs> how can we do, how can we do things better? But so that advanced planning is key. Um, and there's a lot, again, a lot of moving parts that the, you know, that, you know, the public's not going to see, but a sports organization for sure is going to, 
you know, not things, leave things up to chance. So they're going to train their volunteers. They're going to be training their staff. Uh, and, and also, again, those relationships with their local and state officials and federal officials, you know, whether, you know, like, uh, and also international officials, so that advanced planning is key, so that people are understanding what their roles are and how to, how to respond effectively and efficiently. And it can be tough in places like Arlington, Texas, when you have several professional stadiums that may right. be operating simultaneously or <laughs> in the same area. Um, so that can be that can be problematic as well in planning for for some kind of major incident. For sure. Let's talk a little bit about the um, aspect of the Super Bowl that you're you're helping uh, do some planning for a client, the Arizona Hospital Healthcare Association. So mm -hmm. they're involved in coordinating all the medical response for the Phoenix Super Bowl that's going to take place in um, February 2023. Mm -hmm. So what what kind of um, support are you offering them to be in the position to be best prepared for that event? So, I mean, they're doing a lot on their own. We are about to do an exercise with them actually a few weeks after the Super Bowl. But what the kind of planning that under that undertakes just on the on the healthcare side, this is not specific, you know, this is specific to healthcare I can speak to, but you know, there's a lot of when you're planning for a Super Bowl, you're planning for anything. You really, honest to God, it could be because and oftentimes when people think it's not usually just one event, there's usually a cascade of events like, okay something happened. We have to get someone out safely. Okay. People get trampled or whatever those kind of secondary events or, you know, evacuation routes are blocked and people have heard heart, heart attacks while they're waiting. So again, there's, you know, a cascade of events kind of thing. So what I, and planning on, uh, and working with the Arizona hospital and healthcare association, what we'll be doing is ensuring that they have the support and they have thought of things that they hadn't considered would be, to be important in planning for those that large scale event and ensuring do they have you know good communication with the hospitals but it's not just hospitals you know you certainly you want hospitals to be in the highest acuity patients to go to that hospital setting but it, it's also coordinating with um primary care and skilled nursing or anyone else that any other kind of health care provider that can assist and 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 you want let's say something let's say something would would happen you really don't want everyone running to the hospital. You want other, you know, want to coordinate patients where, you know, can they take a walking wounded in a primary care clinic? So making sure and coordinating in advance with those organizations to say, hey, by the way, can you stand up on a Sunday? Normally you're not open, but can you be open just in case something happens? And so again, you're relieving that pressure on that hospital. So or even the, treat them on scene, right? Or treat, treat them, them on scene. Them. And that's why or having, you know, a good example. So the um, I don't know if people know this, but the um, when the when the Boston bomber uh, situation, the Boston Marathon event, which was a horrific event, and you know, what one thing that people don't know is that one of the reasons we didn't have as many, um, you know, casualties or is that the um, Boston um, medical community uses the Boston Marathon as an exercise, as what we call a functional exercise or full-scale exercise every year. And it's something that we, they do every single year and that they use it to, to test their communications and test their coordination and response time. And so, and it happened to be that they put the the bomb near the, um, near the uh, finish line. Yeah, but they <laughs> put it through the finish line. And so they had literally... EMS was there within like less than a minute because it was near the end. And, but they already had an addition, not just, um, you know, not more just be able to respond, but they already had that great communication. They were already working that event and, and, and they used it. And, and we highly recommend, again, I talked about drills and exercises. So, you know, I am a brokered record on that, but those full scale exercises, you know, where you're doing lights and sirens and, you know, medical providers and whatever those, you know, triage tents or whatever those things that are needed or any kind of operational exercises that you could do really do help to give your muscle memory this, um, to their staff so they understand what to do, what they need to do, who their role, you know, what are their roles, who's going to, what steps is we're going to take, what action steps do we have, how we can make decisions to, you know, save life and property. 
Um, and um, so those those things are really key. But Boston Marathon is a good example. Is like they use that as an exercise. So the healthcare community comes together well in advance of that event every year and plans how we're going to do it. What's our scenario this year? And just plans and just has you know has that coordinated. And I think that made it saved lives for sure and saved um, saved la- saved lives and um, those that were injured from that event. Um, so the, the again, in short, the advanced planning is key. Yeah, they were able to actually implement their emergency management plan and test the, the effectiveness of it. That's interesting. They're using an actual event to, to practice. And you're referencing these full-scale exercises and training, rather taking this binder of information on a page and and breathing life into it and testing the the pain points. Mm -hmm. But there's also a kind of a less intensive, less resource intensive version, a tabletop exercise. Can you can you speak to the tabletop exercises and how they can be a practical exercise as well? Well the the discussion based exercises, the tabletop exercises are really valuable when ideally when you're conducting um any kind of full before you even do a full scale exercise. You'll do a tabletop exercise or even a series of them and you can focus and, and you're going to give your 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 audience uh, a set of questions and we call them injects. And we use several master exercise practitioners we have on staff that, that do these um, tabletop exercises. And we just say, OK, here's the situation. Here's the problem. What are you going to do? What what action steps? What you know, what are your decisions you're going to make? And what are the the ripple effects of those decisions and how they make uh, how they're made? So um, that's something that's really helpful. And what ideally we like to do a tabletop exercise on a small scale, or even like I said, a series of them, and then do a functional exercise that's a kind of continuation that's much more kind of like um, that's on the same theme in the same scenario. And when you do that, again, you're giving muscle memory to the staff about what decisions are made. And what I like, the other thing I like about a tabletop exercise is, and you can do it to test your business continuity plan or emergency operations plan, or, or you can test just communications or just evacuation or whatever those things are that you want to test. But it needs to be based on whatever your plan says. And the whole point is to not have any findings and say, hey, we did it all perfectly. No, actually, you failed spectacularly, as I'd like to say, when you... Um, you feel spectacularly when you when you have no findings. You want to find that you that you miss things, and because the whole point is finding plan gaps, and and it gives you an opportunity to say you write an after action report and go, okay, we did this great. We've got A, B, C, X, Y, Z that was great, but on the same time, uh, we missed some things. Hey, we forgot to do A by A, B, C, X, Y, Z, and let's add it to our plan. And um, you can write that for an actual event as well. But that after action report kind of serves as a, you know, guides us of how we can improve our plans overall. But yeah, so the tabletop, thank you for bringing that up. That's just key. Um, People like to do the great shakeout earthquake drill or, you know, lights and sirens, as I call them, uh, boys are their toys, exercises. But, you know, (laughs) it's what I call them. But essentially it's, you know, the lights and sirens and it's exciting and all of that. But again, it needs to be based on what your plan says. And and if there's plan gaps, you get an opportunity to update those plans based on those findings. So that's key. Absolutely. I can imagine there regionally, you might be practicing different things depending on your geographic location or your, your business operations will influence maybe what you need to test and practice more frequently. Um, so Nora, what kind of final advice do you have for sport organizations in regards to emergency management and business continuity? Yeah, the one thing that we really didn't touch on um, is I want to say, know your risks. And what I mean by that is do a hazard vulnerability analysis and say, and it and it could be internal to your organization or it could be external in that, you know, it could be, has your HVAC system or your sewer system gone out? you know, a number of times and that can impact, that can disrupt your business and mean that you can't get into the building or whatever those things, or they're more likely to to go in time of disaster. So that's on internal or workplace. Do you have a workplace violence prevention plan? One would seriously hope you do. If not, we can help you with that too. But um, knowing your risks are and knowing your risks, once you know those risks, and then you can write a plan to address those risks. So 
you know, like we're in, Cal- I'm, we're based in California. We have clients all over the country, but you know, like we, I used to say we didn't need a tornado plan in California. Well, sure enough, we had four tornadoes in 2021. So can't say that anymore, but you know, climate <laughs> change has been that friend to us, but you know what? We don't need a hurricane plan. I would say we didn't need that. And then we had a Pacific hurricane. So in California, but, uh, but the point is know what your risks are and have a plan. I, we don't need a volcano plan that I know. Hawaii, uh, uh, where uh, Think Tech uh, is, they absolutely need a Hawaii. You know, they certainly do need a, a, a volcano plan. So, and if you're in the middle of the, the middle of the country, you definitely need a tornado plan. You know, on the coastal, you need a hurricane plan. So, just know have a good risk for those, and and then train your staff. I just have to say, I can't straight straight you know, um, ha- train your staff in advance uh, so they know what their roles are, and even if you know, they maybe not have to serve in that role, you know, on a daily basis, but they might have to if, if no one's available or someone's evacuated, can't get into the building to figure out, you know, what the next steps are. So that's important as well. You don't want that plan locked away in the building if something happens to the building, right? No, put it on a flash drive on your, fr- that's another tip, put on a flash drive on your keychain, have it in the cloud, put it on your phone, you know, Make it as simple as possible, and then you can always add to it later. But, you know, don't make it. I always tell people, you know, you might have a beautiful color-coded seven-page, you know, seven-inch binder, but it will not help you in a disaster because it's too big. You know, it'll serve as a doorstop to get your ass out of the building if you have to evacuate, but it won't help you in a disaster. So uh, make it actionable. Well, thank you, Nora, for your insight into the planning for the worst in sports, survival in a crisis. Yeah. Thank you to our viewers for joining us today on the Sports Playbook. Our next episode will host Rob Taylor, who will discuss the U.S. men's national team and collegiate wheelchair basketball. We will see you then. All right. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.